Hi, this is Sir Jet, and welcome to another episode of the Rizal Lectures. Today, I am here at the house of Dr. Jose Rizal in Calamba City. To begin this episode, let me share to you a little trivia. Do you know that this house is not the original house of Dr. Jose Rizal? The original house was burned in the 1880s by the Spaniards when the Spaniards evicted the Rizal family out of Calamba. This house that you are seeing right now was built only in 1950 and today it serves as a replica of the original house. But do you know that Rizal lived longer elsewhere than in this house? Yes, because he was a constant traveler for most of his life. He was in Europe when this house was burned, so he never got to see this house again when he returned to the country for good. Now let's go to our lecture for today. Rizal the Traveler In this lesson, I will walk you through the places where Rizal traveled. We will study what happened there and what significant contribution that experience had on Rizal. Basically, Rizal had two trips abroad. So this lecture is divided into two parts. The first one is Rizal's first trip abroad and the second part is Rizal's second trip abroad. There are three dominant themes of his activities in his travels. Rizal would be there abroad for academic purpose, to get a degree. He was also there for leisure, enjoy his time as a tourist. And the greatest reason is the nationalistic purpose. He was there to learn as much as he can because he has a mission which is to help improve the life in his home country. So let's begin with Rizal's first trip abroad, which was from 1882 to 1887. Rizal stopped being a UST student and went to Spain to continue his studies there. Very few people knew about Rizal's first trip to Europe. Not even his parents knew that he was leaving. This was planned carefully by his brother, Pashano. He wanted to make it appear that Rizal would just continue his medical studies in Spain. But on top of that, Pashano would tell Rizal that he had another objective why he was going abroad. And what was Rizal's secret mission? He was to observe keenly the life and culture the government and laws, the industry and commerce, and the languages in Europe. In order to prepare himself in the mighty task of liberating his oppressed countrymates from Spanish rule. By observing this, it is hoped that Rizal would think of something that would help life of the Filipinos become better. In Rizal's first trip abroad, he was able to step on four different countries, Spain, France, Germany, and the Austria-Hungary Empire. Here are the flags of those countries during that time. First stopover was Spain. So this is a picture of Rizal in Spain. He met other Filipinos there like Marcelo del Pilar, Graciano Lopez Jaina, Juan Luna, Antonio Luna. They are brothers by the way. Mariano Ponce, Jose Alejandrino, and many more. As you can see, there were many Filipinos already in Spain even before Rizal arrived there. They were living there for many years and they called themselves the Ilustrados. Ilustrados means enlightened ones. Because of their stay in Europe, they were enlightened. They got to learn about liberalism and were able to compare the situation in Europe and in the Philippines. They were able to see that so much freedom was being enjoyed in Europe while in the Philippines there was oppression. So they were called the enlightened ones. The Ilustrados were the children of very rich natives or very rich Filipinos in the Philippines and they were sent to Spain to study because if you're rich or if you're mega rich you can afford to send your children to Europe to study so when these children of rich Filipinos arrived in Europe primarily to study they also got to learn about liberalism some of them eventually settled there 
they found wives and jobs in Spain and so they never returned to the Philippines. Now, these Ilustrados, upon seeing that liberalism was being employed in Europe and in the Philippines it's not, they started to dream of better treatment for Filipinos. They wanted liberalism to also be practiced in the Philippines. They wanted to tell the good Spaniards in Spain to make some reforms, to make the good Spaniards tell the bad Spaniards in the Philippines to do a better job or might as well send them back to Spain and replace them with good Spaniards so that the Filipino people can experience liberalism. So the Ilustrados put up organizations to advance their cause and they also use their talents such as painting and writing to promote their advocacies. Now one day the Ilustrados had a big victory party. Two of them, Juan Luna and Felix Resurrection Hidalgo, won first place and second place respectively in an international painting competition. They emerged as the best painters in Spain during that time. They defeated in the contest Spaniards and other Europeans and that is a very very big victory for the brown-skinned Filipinos living there in Spain for the Ilustrados. So they had a big party and Rizal was there in the party and he delivered the keynote speech and we call that speech Brindis. Now what does Brindis contain? Rizal praised his compatriots Juan Luna and Felix Resurrection Hidalgo for winning the gold medal and the silver medal in the international painting competition. Juan Luna won for his work Spolarium. We can see this painting, the original painting in the National Museum in Manila. This is a very huge painting and it talks about how Filipinos are being treated in the Philippines by the Spanish colonizers. That is the hidden or the secret meaning behind this painting. Uh, this is the painting of uh, Hidalgo. The title is Christian Virgins Exposed to the Populace. It has the same theme as the Spolarium. It's about uh, life in the old Roman Empire. But the hidden meaning here is that we Filipinos are abused by the Spanish colonizers. These works are reflections of the reality of politics, society, and moral life of the Filipinos under the Spanish conquerors. That's why we consider Luna and Hidalgo as heroes because they did something, not only uh, winning a prize for themselves, but also expressing what was happening here in the Philippines in that very dark period of our time and trying to make some Spaniards realize it's time to apply liberalism in the Philippines. And in the speech of Rizal, he has this very controversial line. He said, genius knows no race. He said that geniuses are like flowers that can sprout anywhere, everywhere. It can sprout in Spain, it can sprout in the Philippines. And he's saying that Filipinos can also be geniuses. Not only Spaniards, but also Filipinos are good and great. We can do and accomplish great things, genius things, just like winning this international painting competition. Now, this speech is considered as a direct attack and challenge to the Spanish regime. During Rizal's time, the Spaniards in the Philippines would call us Indios. Indios means dumb and stupid. So when Rizal said that Filipinos can be geniuses, it's a very radical idea. It's against what the Spaniards were teaching us here in the Philippines. So, indeed, the Brindis speech was offensive. There was a journalist during the party and he recorded what Rizal said. He wrote it and published it in a newspaper. And the newspaper reached the Philippines. Of course, the Spanish officials or the Spanish authorities here in the Philippines got offended with what Rizal said in his Brindis speech. And so Rizal became a marked man beginning that time. Rizal's mother wrote to him and uh, explained to him the effect of his speech here in the Philippines. So Doña Chodora wrote a letter on December 11, 1884 and told Rizal to refrain from writing articles that might offend the friars and the regime here in the Philippines and that he should 
remember that he's a Catholic and he has duties to the Catholic Church and one of which is to avoid offending the Catholic authorities. And his mother also warned him that if he would uh, continue to attack the uh, authorities here in the Philippines, it might cause his death later on. So it's better for him to just stop his studies and just come home. Now, after Rizal received this message from his mother, he wrote her a very lengthy response. He said, even if I put an end to my writing of articles, I will still have enemies and life can't be without any sorrow. So Rizal is saying here that even if he stops attacking the Spaniards, he would still have enemies. Life is like that. And then he also said that conscience has to decide whether to submit or perish in the society where a person is born. The best legacy parents can give their children are upright judgment, generosity in the exercise of rights, and perseverance in adversity. So Rizal is saying here that who I am right now is actually the product of your upbringing. And lastly, he says a son can pay honor to his parents through honesty and a good name. He assured his mother that what he is doing will make his mother proud one day. The bottom line of what Rizal is trying to say to his mother is that he will not stop in what he is doing. He will still continue to write about what he thinks is right. So what do you think? Was Rizal an obedient son to his mother? Now aside from Rizal's academic activities in Spain, he also had formal lessons in painting and sculpture. He enrolled in an academy there. And he also attended a fencing school, the schools of Sanz and Carbonell. So as you can see, Rizal made use of his time there to be very productive in every way. Now, after his stay in Spain, Rizal went to France. Why? Because he wanted to improve his credentials in medicine. He's looking forward to specialize in ophthalmology. So he visited several hospitals and doctors to observe how they do ophthalmology in that country. So here is a list of the people and hospitals that Rizal visited in France. Also, when Rizal was in France, he drew a comic book on the monkey and the turtle. It's a comic book for kids. The monkey and the turtle is a Filipino fable which Rizal popularized while he was in Europe. Rizal eventually chose Germany as the place where he will spend his specialization in ophthalmology. He studied in the University of Heidelberg and he was there to witness the 5th centenary celebration or the 500th anniversary of that university. While in Heidelberg, Rizal wrote the famous poem, The Flowers of Heidelberg or A las Flores de Heidelberg in Spanish. He also joined a chess players club in his dormitory. While in Germany, Rizal also spent time with Reverend Karl Ulmer, a Protestant pastor. He lived in his house for three months and because of his association with the German pastor, the Filipinos back home spread a rumor that Rizal might have converted to Protestantism, which was a very big deal during that time. It was also in Germany where Rizal published the Noli Me Tangere. He lacked funds, but his friend Maximo Viola funded the publishing of the Noli Me Tangere. And today in Germany, we can see a statue of Rizal because he made a lot of accomplishments for himself and for the Filipino people during his stay in Germany. So as you can see, not only the Filipinos are proud of Rizal, but also the Germans. After finishing his specialization in ophthalmology, Rizal went on a grand vacation in the Austria-Hungary Empire. It was there where he met Professor Ferdinand Blumentritt, who became his best friend. Professor Blumentritt was a director in a university in the present-day Czech Republic. In their time, the Czech Republic wasn't existing yet, so the place was part of the big Austria-Hungary Empire. So Blumentritt technically is an Austrian and what's unique about him is that he has a lot of interest in Spanish culture and in Philippine culture. 
So when he met Rizal, they had a great time together, sharing their knowledge to one another. They became pen pals. They exchanged letters almost every day. And Rizal even sketched Blumentritt's portrait. And this is the sketch. This is the hand of Rizal. He's not only a writer, he's also a great artist. To cap his stay in the Austria-Hungary Empire, Rizal and his traveling companion, Maximo Viola, stayed in the very famous Hotel Metropole in Vienna, the capital of the empire. And according to Ambeto Campos' book, Rizal's Teeth, Bonifacio's Bones, a prostitute came to Rizal's room one night. This is according to Viola's diary. He wrote, a temptress of extraordinary beauty and irresistible attraction offer for a moment the cup of mundane pleasure to the apostle of Philippine freedom. Wow, this is a very uh, flowery language. But in simple language, Rizal slept with a prostitute. <laughs> and according to Viola, this is the only slip he saw in Rizal in their six months together traveling across the Austria-Hungary Empire. So it didn't happen very often, just once. So that ended Rizal's first trip abroad. What is the effect of this trip to Rizal's transformation in terms of his faith and social perspective? First, we can see that Rizal had a sudden change in his religious outlook. Before, when he was in the Philippines, the Catholic Church was really something very big, something uh, that is impeccable. But when he was in Europe during his first trip, he probably saw the flaws and he started to attack or to question through his writings and speeches the church authorities. And for his social outlook, we can see that he gained a wide view of cultures. By being exposed to the different countries and cultures in Europe, his worldview became wider. Something that he couldn't gain while staying in the Philippines. So in essence, his trip abroad changed him. Rizal's first trip abroad was monumental. There was a great transformation that happened in him. Now let's discuss Rizal's second trip abroad. In this trip, he visited the following countries. There are a lot more on the list compared to the first trip. Hong Kong, Macau, Japan, USA, England, Spain again, France again, and finally Belgium. Now what is the background for the second trip abroad? After Rizal's first trip, remember that he was able to publish the Nolimi Tanghere? Now at home, the Noli was controversial. It got banned by the Spanish authorities. Why not? Because Rizal attacked the Catholic authorities. Remember Padre Damaso and how bad he was in the novel? So naturally, the Catholic Church hated Rizal for this novel. He found himself in hot waters because of the Noli. Thus, he was advised to leave the country for a while for his own safety and for things to cool down. It was the governor general himself who advised Rizal. So Rizal left for Europe, but he had several stopovers. The first one was in Hong Kong, and it was said that he was followed by a spy when he was there. A Spanish spy by the name of Jose Sainz de Varanda, and sent by the governor general. He was there to shadow Rizal and to see what he's up to. Rizal had nothing to hide. He stayed in the house of a Filipino, Jose Maria Basa, who later inherited Rizal's library and many other uh, personal properties after his execution. So that's the picture of uh, Mr. Jose Maria Basa, a Filipino living in Hong Kong. Also in Hong Kong, Rizal met another Filipino, Balbino Mauricio, who has a house in Binondo and uh, became the model of the Filipino houses or the Filipino mansions in his novels in Noli and Fili. Balbino Mauricio has a house in Binondo which he left because he stayed for good in Hong Kong after he met some uh, controversies with the Spanish authorities in the Philippines. 
While Rizal was in Hong Kong, he was able to write in his diary that he was able to observe the celebration of the Chinese New Year. He was able to attend a Hong Kong theater, ate laureate food for the first time in his life, and saw the houses of the rich Spanish priests or Dominicans in Hong Kong. He also observed that in Hong Kong, they have separate cemeteries for Protestants, Catholics, and Muslims. Rizal wrote to his favorite pen pal, Blumentritt, that Hong Kong is a small city, but it is very clean. A nearby city is Macau. Jose Maria Basa accompanied Rizal to Macau. So they were tourists in that uh, city. The city is under Portuguese rule. They met a Filipino there by the name of Francisco Lecaros, who is married to a Portuguese woman. Rizal wrote that Macau is a small city that is gloomy sad and almost dead so maybe Rizal didn't enjoy his stay in Macau after Macau and Hong Kong Rizal went to Japan and he stayed in the house of Juan Perez Caballero he is the secretary of the Spanish League or legation it's like the embassy or the Spanish embassy in Japan so Juan Perez Caballero is like the ambassador the spanish ambassador in japan and he invited rizal to work in the embassy some say that the ambassador invited rizal to stay in the embassy so that he could spy on him but rizal agreed because he had nothing to hide and also for the reason that he could earn money while working in the embassy it is also in japan where rizal met Osei San became Rizal's girlfriend. Rizal was 27 years old at that time and Osei San was 23. It could have been a perfect match. Rizal had a work. Osei San is from a wealthy family but their relationship was short-lived because Rizal left Japan in a hurry. Rizal said to have realized that his mission in life is not to stay in Japan but to go to Europe and help liberate the Filipino people. So he said goodbye to Osei-san. This is uh, an excerpt from his love letter to Osei-san. He said, sayonara, sayonara. While in Japan, Rizal wrote in his diary that he was quick to learn this language thanks to Osei-san, who was his tutor. And he also learned about Japanese arts, music, and the martial arts judo. He was amazed by the beauty of the country, the people, especially Osei-san, and the culture. One thing that Rizal observed is that there were very few robbers in Japan. So it means that Japan was a rich country during that time already. Rizal had a friend in Japan, a writer named Techo Suhiro. He's a novelist. Just like Rizal, he was advocating for liberalism in his country. It was said that Techo Suhiro got his ideas from Rizal specifically from the Noli and the Fili because Techo Suhiro also wrote two novels very similar to Rizal's novels. Now after Japan, Rizal crossed the Pacific Ocean and arrived in San Francisco, California in the United States West Coast. He didn't get a very good treatment in the United States. Rizal didn't enjoy his stay there. First, he got quarantined for eight days in San Francisco just because he was an Asian. During that time, there was discrimination against Asians in the United States because the Americans think that Chinese people are dirty and they are spreading a disease in the United States. So before allowing them to enter the country, they must be quarantined first in the port. Unlike other nationalities who are not from Asia, they don't get quarantined. They enter the country instantly without restrictions. So Rizal wrote in his diary, I wouldn't advise anyone to make this trip to America. It's crazy here. <laughs> and on the train ride from San Francisco to New York, Rizal wrote about a terrible experience because the American passengers with him would whisper among themselves or would murmur saying negative words about Rizal because he's Asian. The Americans didn't know that Rizal could understand English. So all along, Rizal understood what these Americans were saying about him. And it was a very long trip from the West Coast to the East Coast. 
So that's a lot of negative words or bad words he heard from the Americans in that trip. So Rizal wrote in his diary, America is indeed the land of the free and the home of the brave, but only for the whites. Because Rizal personally felt the discrimination of the whites against the Asians and the blacks. So he's criticizing land of the free, home of the brave. Yes, it's true, but only for the whites. That's why when Rizal was in New York, he saw the Niagara Falls, but he was not impressed. He said that the falls of Los Baños are more beautiful than Niagara. He said this probably because he was unimpressed with America due to the racial discrimination he experienced. Obviously, the Niagara Falls, as you can see in the picture, is so big, while the waterfalls in Los Baños is so small. But for Rizal, the small one is more beautiful. Even though the Niagara is so grand, it's not beautiful, according to Rizal. After the United States, Rizal crossed the Atlantic Ocean and landed in England. And it's in London where he stayed. He worked in the library annotating a history book written by Antonio de Morga. He was a Spanish official and historian who stayed in the Philippines in the late 1500s. This is the time when the Spaniards had just arrived here in the Philippines, 1500s. And he wrote a book, a history book. He described the life of the natives in the Philippines in the 1500s. Sadly, there was no copy of that history book to be found here in the Philippines. And Rizal found a rare copy in the London Library. Since the Xerox machine was not yet invented in his time, Rizal copied that book by hand. Every day he was in the London Library copying De Morga's book and adding his annotations or comments and explanations per sentence or per paragraph in De Morga's history book. And that book was published, okay, or the results annotated the version of De Morga's book. Rizal emphasized that before the coming of the Spaniards, we already had a great culture and civilization. Rizal disproved the false teaching of the Spaniards that our ancestors were barbaric. In his time, that's what the Spaniards were teaching us Filipinos, that we were barbaric and that the Spaniards were the ones who taught us some manners and that we owe to the Spaniards who we are. We owe our good manners to them. Before them, our ancestors were really rude and barbaric. But Rizal disproved that in this book, in the history book that he annotated. Because De Morga, probably he's a good Spaniard or an objective Spaniard, wrote that our ancestors already had a great culture. We were civilized. We were not barbaric. So Rizal emphasized that in his annotated version of the book, Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas. On weekends, the library is closed, so Rizal tried to look for some entertainment in London, and he didn't find any. So he wrote in his diary, Sundays here are very boring, every place is closed, there are neither shops nor theaters, and if music is played, it's only religious music. Only the churches were open on Sundays. And uh, Rizal maybe would like to go to the mall or to the movies, but they were closed. It's also in England where Rizal met Dr. Reinhold Rost. He's an editor and he asked Rizal to write something or to contribute to his journal or to his magazine. And Rizal wrote articles, namely specimens of Tagalog folklore and two Eastern fables. So Rizal was productive in England. He was able to publish articles for an English magazine sharing stories that are popular here in the Philippines. Certain alamat or certain fables that we Filipinos know, Rizal shared to his European friend and it was published in Europe. And other Europeans were able to learn about our culture and literature. It's also in England where Rizal had an English girlfriend. Her name is Gertrude Beckett. She is the landlord of Rizal. Rizal stayed in her house as a boarder because the Beckett boarding house is just a short walk from the London Library or the London Museum where Rizal was uh, annotating the history book by De Morga. 
but it was a short-lived relationship because when Rizal finished writing the history book or annotating the history book he left England and he also left Gertrude Beckett for good Rizal went on to France and stayed in the house of Juan Luna and his wife Paz Pardo de Tavera and it's also in France where Rizal met Eduardo Busted, a Filipino-British married to a Filipina. Mr. Eduardo had two daughters. One of the daughters is Nelly, who became Rizal's girlfriend. Nelly Busted is part Filipina, part British, but she considered herself Filipina. And that really impressed Rizal. So he pursued that relationship with Nelly. But the relationship didn't last very long because after some time, Rizal left France for good and went on to another country. But before leaving France, Rizal had his legacy by forming some organizations, the Kidlat Club, the Indios Bravos, and the Sociedad RDLM or Redención de los Malayos. These groups advocate the pride of the Malayan race. While in Europe, uh, Rizal formed these organizations to tell the European people that we brown-skinned people of the Philippines, we are a great race. We are good and uh, we can do a lot of good things. So Rizal contributed to the building of Filipino pride while in a foreign land. Rizal was also in Paris to witness two big events. Number one, the centennial celebration of the French Revolution. So there was a big, big celebration in France for uh, the French Revolution, which happened 100 years earlier. And Rizal was there to celebrate with the Frenchmen. And he was also there for the inauguration of the Eiffel Tower. When uh, this tower was uh, inaugurated and there was uh, a ribbon cutting ceremony, Rizal was there in that ceremony. He witnessed it. Rizal's next stop after France was Spain and when he was back in Spain, Rizal contributed greatly to the propaganda movement. So this is his old gang, his group that wanted liberalism to be applied in the Philippines. This time, instead of painting, his group started a newspaper, the La Solidaridad, and their goal is to make life better for the native Filipinos. For the Philippines to become a province of Spain. For the Filipinos or the natives to be treated equally with the white Spaniards. Because when we become a province of Spain, that means we become Spanish citizens. And so we have rights, same rights with the Spaniards in Spain. And that is the goal of La Solidaridad. And Another goal is to have representation in the Spanish Cortes or Congress for a Filipino congressman to sit in the Spanish Congress to participate in the lawmaking of the Spaniards so that we can create laws that would favor the Filipino natives. Very nice objectives of La Solidaridad. So they wrote essays and articles to advocate these things. One article that Rizal wrote in La Solidaridad is Filipinas Dentro de Cien Años, The Philippines a Century Hence, and Sobre la Indolencia de los Filipinos, or Indolence of the Filipinos. And these are just samples of Rizal's greatest essays published in La Solidaridad. There are many more which we will study in another lesson. But things didn't go well with Rizal and his La Solidaridad compatriots. He left the group, went back to the Philippines. But before going back to the Philippines, he had a stopover in Belgium, where he published his second novel, The El Filibusterismo. Like Danoli, he had no money to publish it. But good thing his friend Valentin Ventura came to the rescue. He funded the publishing of El Filibusterismo. It is said that uh, Rizal found the cheapest printing press in Belgium. That's why it was here where the novel was published. Another trivia about Rizal when he was in Belgium, in Ambet Ocampo's book, Rizal Without the Overcoat, we read about Jose Alejandrino, Rizal's friend and uh, companion in Belgium. And in Alejandrino's diary, he wrote that one day Rizal invited him 
to a house of two ladies to have some amusement. Alejandrino liked the amusement and asked Rizal if they can visit again. What could be this amusement that uh, Alejandrino seemed to get addicted to? But Rizal said, uh, no, we cannot visit that place very often. Let's just do it once a month. Because if we do it more than once a month, it is called a vice. So we don't want to get into any vice. So let's just visit that house once a month. What could be this vice? What could be this house with ladies? It is up to you to imagine. So there, we have finished walking you through Rizal's second journey abroad. And so we go back to the big question. Was Pashano successful in his intention of sending Rizal abroad? Was he successful in his intention of Rizal learning a lot about European life and applying all his learnings here in the Philippines? Looking back, we can see that Rizal was very productive, both academically and patriotically. He got his degree in medicine, he was able to publish two novels that were game changers in our history. He wrote many other books and articles and essays that became pride of the Filipino race. The list is so long and we can really see that Rizal had a productive trip abroad. He also made a lot of friends, academicians, Filipino compatriots, foreigners, even girlfriends. And he also wrote a lot. In our time, he can be considered as a blogger or a vlogger. He wrote about his experiences, his insights, things he observed, how he felt in certain occasions. And so he was also very productive in this aspect. Because of Rizal's blogs, we learned so much about his time. We learned so much about what was happening in the places he visited in that time. So as a conclusion, to the lesson Rizal the Traveler, we can say that we can choose to be like Rizal. One day we may also be travelers. Chances are high that we may be working in the global workplace or we can be abroad as tourists. Whatever the case may be, we can choose to be like Rizal. Follow the good things that he did, but not to follow the bad things that he did. Another application is that let us write, let us document our experiences in foreign lands because one day people can read about them. And another lesson is when we are in foreign lands, let us lift high the Filipino pride. Let us become proud Filipinos and let us contribute to the greatness of our race by doing good things in those places. So there you have it. I hope you learned many things today. I'll see you in the next episode. This is Sir Jet saying goodbye and see you around.